Welcome, I'm Katherine Hadro, and this is EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Condemning comments, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, a prominent Catholic politician, calls pro-lifers sellouts and hypocrites in a recent interview. We speak with Pelosi's Archbishop, Archbishop Corleone of San Francisco, for his reaction to her comments, which contradict church teaching. A legacy of life, the godfather of the pro-life movement, Joe Scheidler, has died. His son joins us to recount his father's pioneering work for the pro-life cause. Plus, a pro-life sneak peek. We hear from the Christendom College student body president for a preview of her virtual March for Life rally speech. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, the most prominent Catholic politician in the U.S. after President Joe Biden, recently criticized the pro-life movement's efforts to stand up for the unborn. In a podcast interview with former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton last week, Pelosi accused pro-lifers of putting their opposition to abortion over the principle of democracy and accused pro-lifers of being sellouts. Take a listen. And then you take the abortion issue. And many of these people are um, very good people. That's just their point of view. But they are willing to sell the whole democracy down the river for that one issue. Amen. <laughs> we will wrap up on the note of, I think, your nine grandchildren yes. and <laughs> my three grandchildren. So we have a, a dozen perfectly good reasons to get up every day and continue the fight for the future we want, not just for our grandkids, but really for every child all the children. Uh, to live up to his or her God-given potential. That's what it's all about. That was the voice of former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton agreeing with Pelosi's comments on abortion. Pelosi continued to slam pro-lifers, saying people who reject abortion should, quote, love contraception. And anyone with opposing views are hypocrites if they don't have large families. The Archbishop of San Francisco, who is Pelosi's Archbishop, quickly provided a strong response, saying the House Speaker does not speak for the Catholic Church. Archbishop Salvatore Corleone released a statement saying in part, quote, to begin with the obvious, Nancy Pelosi does not speak for the Catholic Church. She speaks as a high-level, important government leader and as a private citizen. He continued, and on the question of the equal dignity of human life in the womb, she, Pelosi, also speaks in direct contradiction to a fundamental human right that Catholic teaching has consistently championed for 2,000 years. Joining us now via Skype is Archbishop Salvatore Cordelion of the Archdiocese of San Francisco. Your Excellency, welcome to the show. I just read part of your statement to our viewers responding to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's recent comments on pro-lifers. But can you expand? What are your thoughts to what the House Speaker, a Catholic, had to say about the pro-life movement, particularly about pro-lifers being sellouts? There are two aspects to her comments that uh, bothered me very much. One is, uh, we know how bitterly divided and polarized the country is. We have President Biden speaking a lot about unity and healing. In his inaugural address, he said, we have to get past this red versus blue and conservative versus liberal. We need humility and tolerance and walk in the other person's shoes. Now, whether or not he actually pursues a path of unity is another question, but this is what he's talking, and everyone knows this is a need. So uh, when she dismisses people who give priority to the abortion issue in guiding their decision how to vote, uh, uh, as selling out our democracy, this is heightening and worsening the polarization. It's the exact opposite of what we need to be doing. I've been hearing and reading for years and years about this, that we need to pay attention to people who think differently than we are. Mm -hmm. and, but I don't see people doing it. And this is an example about, this is just one of many examples mm -hmm. of how that can, contributes to it and it worsens the situation. Mm -hmm. The other thing is how she's misguiding so many Catholics who, uh, think that because she is a prominent political leader, a very important person in our, mm -hmm. our country and Catholic, and that people think it's acceptable for Catholics to, to favor abortion. And that's just simply not true. I was very careful how I worded that statement you, you cited there. 
it's it's church teaching, but it's not exclusively church teaching. I mean, this is killing children in the mother's womb, just as killing children outside of the womb, is not something we need revelation to understand is wrong. There are certain truths of the natural moral law that we can understand by reason alone. Murder is wrong, stealing is wrong, arson is wrong, calumny, and all these things. Mm -hmm. Church teaching, specifically, it's not like revealed doctrine. It's not a matter of religious belief. It's a, a fundamental human right that church teaching reinforces, champions, and promotes mm -hmm. this fundamental human right. Catholics, all, all matters of justice, Catholics mm -hmm. favor and promote. One of the most troubling remarks to me was when the House Speaker said people who oppose abortion should love contraception and pro-lifers are hypocrites if they don't have large families. Your thoughts on those specific remarks? Just look around. We've had a contraceptive culture for the last 50 years. Do you see any diminishment of, of abortion because people are using contraception? It feeds into the mentality of this uh, disegregation or dis their separation of, you know, marriage, uh, sex and procreation, childbearing and child rearing, mm -hmm. all it's a, it's a package deal. Once you separate that out, uh, if if sex is divorced from all of that, then sort of the contraceptive mentality contributes to that uh, that mentality, and contraception doesn't always work. So you need a backup. Abortion is backup contraception. Mm -hmm. So it just it feeds into this narrative that's uh, tearing our country down because it's breaking up families. It's uh, abusing people in relationships. It's kids growing up in poverty and broken families. So it's it's feeding a narrative that is actually destructive. Mm -hmm. We need to reclaim this vision of the wholesomeness and, and the good for the society of sex, marriage, and child bearing, child rearing, being within the marital embrace and the intact family. Absolutely, and I would just add, women deserve better than contraception, and not every Catholic pro-life family open to life is blessed with a large family. God is the author of life. Uh, Your Excellency, can you explain, you, you mentioned this earlier, but why is it truly scandalous when prominent Catholic politicians advance and support policies which directly contradict the church? And of course, we know House Speaker Pelosi is not the only pro-abortion Catholic politician. We're about one week into a President Joe Biden administration, only the second Catholic like U.S. president, and of course he has a pro-abortion agenda as well. Why is this scandalous? It contradicts the church, again, on these issues of fundamental human rights and, and, and justice. Uh, I mean, it would be bad enough if they were to say something like, oh, I don't believe Christ is really present in the Eucharist. That would be specifically contradicting the church. But this is contradicting the church on a matter that is not specifically Catholic doctrine. Again, this is a matter mm -hmm. of fundamental human rights. So we have political leaders championing an injustice and people thinking that that's okay for Catholics to do, but it's not. Catholics cannot favor anything that is evil. We don't. We oppose evil. The killing of children in their mother's womb is evil. We need to give women real choice. Uh, it, it really uh, uh, unveils the lie behind the pro-choice rhetoric. Mm -hmm. uh, those of us in pastoral ministry, we hear women say that, I didn't want to go through with it, but I felt like I had no choice. Mm -hmm. The problem is that women don't have choice, not that they do, because all the other choices, those resources have dried up. Abortion is the go-to solution. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's scandalous because it leads people into error thinking that this is something acceptable, but this is something evil. It's not acceptable. Catholics cannot accept this in favor. We must fight against it as we always fight against evil, however that evil manifests itself. Absolutely. I want to be careful in my phrasing of this next question because I know it's truly a private matter between a Catholic and his or her pastor or his and her bishop, and you are, as I mentioned, Nancy Pelosi's archbishop. But what is the church's understanding about when it is necessary to deny someone Holy Communion for the sake of their soul? That has to be, yes, you're right, uh, after uh, conversations, private conversations, to try to move the persons in, in their conscience. We have a bigger problem, too, in that so many Catholics don't even understand the concept of worthiness to receive communion, right, to be in a state of grace. Um, and before COVID, I, I often question how many people just nonchalantly go up to receive communion when they're really not supposed to be. Even missing mass of one's own free will 
is a serious enough sin that one must uh, confess and receive absolution in the sacrament before receiving communion again. So the, the bigger problem is Catholics no longer understand the mm -hmm. idea of worthiness to receive communion. It's just seen as a sort of a token gesture of welcome and belonging. So we first, we, we have a huge catechetical effort here. Uh, then when people who are kind of manifestly and prominent going against church teaching, going against these basic, basic values, we see when you, and there's a heightened issue in terms of the scandal it causes when, again, it can leave other people into error. So uh, for that kind of action to make sense uh, to a lot of people, we need to reclaim this sense of, of what it means to receive. What are you really saying when you receive communion? It, to me, it goes hand in hand with this decline in the belief of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. So uh, the bishops now have a, the USCCB, we formed a, a working group to focus on what we call Eucharistic coherence. So mm -hmm. it, it's a very important issue, but it's part of this bigger picture. Absolutely. Well, thank you for your clarity and leadership here. Archbishop Salvatore Corleone of the Archdiocese of San Francisco, thank you. You're welcome. To continue this discussion, we're joined now on Skype by Mallory Quigley, the Vice President of Communications for the Susan B. Anthony List and a fellow Catholic. Mallory, welcome. What did you make of House Speaker Pelosi's remarks of pro-lifers when you first heard them? It was definitely uh, upsetting, but not shocking. I was struck by the fact that she said it gave her particular grief as a Catholic to see other Catholics carrying their conscience with them into the voting booth. And it was rather bizarre, the, the ensuing discussion about mm -hmm. grandchildren and, and the future of America it being its children. There's just a lot of cognitive dissonance there, and it reminded me a bit of the uh, press secretary's briefing last week when she was asked about the Hyde Amendment. Uh, which is about forcing taxpayers to fund abortion on demand or not. Mm -hmm. And she pivoted to Biden's Catholic faith as if uh, these two, one, the devoutness of the person speaking somehow legitimizes the policy position that they're taking, which is radically outside of the church's mm -hmm. teaching. Mm -hmm. And that was in response to EW News Nightly's Owen Jensen's right. question. Uh, Mallory, in that same podcast interview with Speaker Pelosi, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton said the abortion rate went down in the 90s under a Democratic president. She attributed it to contraception, education, and, quote, mm -hmm. stigma-free conversations. How do you, Mallory, respond when abortion advocates make that argument? Yes. Well, the, the, there's no one better on this than Dr. Michael New, so, who I think viewers would be familiar with. And I think what's important to know is that while it's true that contraception use did increase during the 90s, that unplanned pregnancies, the rate has dipped up and down since that time. And there's not really a clear line from to both of those things. In fact, more and more women over the last few decades have been choosing life when faced with unexpected pregnancies. And during that period that uh, former Secretary Clinton was talking about, the number of Americans who called themselves pro-life actually increased from 1990 to 1991. So there's really not a clear uh, line to be drawn there. And increasingly, thanks to ultrasound, thanks to our understanding of the reality of what's going on inside the womb, more and more Americans are choosing life um, following unexpected pregnancies, regardless of whether or not they're using contraception. Mm -hmm. The Democratic leader also said she herself comes from a family that would like to see her soft in her message on the abortion issue, but she doesn't think the pro-life view is for everyone. What can mm -hmm. we do, Mallory, to show our lawmakers that protecting <laughs> life from conception until natural death is important? Yes, well, that's like saying, you know, reality isn't for everyone. I mean, the fact of the matter is there is a unique person growing in the womb from the moment of natural fertilization through onto natural death. There's a unique human being there um, that just needs time and uh, nourishment and a safe place to grow, much like all of us. Uh, there needs to be political consequences for our legislators. Uh, they need to feel the heat. They need to lose their jobs if they're not living this reality. It's not, um, you know, the Catholic, solely Catholic teaching, like the Archbishop was saying. This is a matter of basic human rights, natural law, just uh, basic um, mm -hmm. 
embryology and understanding how it is that human beings come into being. So there needs to be political consequences for Speaker Pelosi and anyone else who denies this reality and um, votes in support of extreme pro-abortion policies. Mallory, while I have you, it's a big week for the pro-life movement. It's the week of the March for Life, and it will look different uh, this year. But can you just share some quick thoughts about the significance of the March for Life uh, week after the Biden inauguration? Yeah, well, it's a it's a very um, meaningful time right now. 48 years since Roe versus Wade, where we've just um, you know we have had a pro-abortion administration. Uh, inaugurated into the White House, and we're looking at the most pro-abortion government that uh, our country has ever seen, unified pro-abortion government. It is a strange time between uh, all the other issues that are going on right now, including the pandemic. It is incredibly important that pro-life Americans stay engaged, that they participate in the march virtually, that they participate in the life chains that are going on in um, states across the country to continue to be a public voice and a public face for the unborn, because remember that the people that we're defending, they are invisible. We can't see them. They, they have no voice but ours. And so to stay engaged in this fight, it's incredibly important. So well said. Mallory Quigley with the Susan B. Anthony List. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Catherine. The godfather of the pro-life movement, Joe Scheidler, died on Martin Luther King Day at the age of 93. Do something pro-life every day. If it's a prayer, if it's going to a clinic, if it is a, a talking to another person about abortion, do something pro-life every day. That was a 2017 interview with Scheidler. He was the founder of the Pro-Life Action League and is credited for developing pro-life activism following the 1973 Roe v. Wade Supreme Court ruling. Scheidler died of pneumonia at his Chicago home last week. Joining us now on Skype is Eric Scheidler, executive director of Pro-Life Action League and Joe Scheidler's son, his oldest child, Eric. Welcome to the show, and please be assured of our prayers and condolences at this time. Eric, first, can you just share some words honoring your father's life and legacy in the pro-life movement? Tell us about him and what you see as his greatest contribution. Well, viewers just learned an awful lot about him from that tiny little clip. Uh, my father's motto, which he learned from the Benedictine order to which he belonged for eight years, in fact, he was only a week away from his priestly ordination when he, uh, in deaconate and then priestly ordination, when he realized this was not his call. He didn't find out for another about 10 years what his call would be, fighting for the lives of unborn children. But he deeply uh, took into his soul the Benedictine motto of ora et labora, Latin for pray and work. And for my father, it was everything was always grounded in prayer, was always grounded in the love that he felt for unborn children, the tenderness he always had in his heart for children from a very young age. And, um, and then the labora part. And he was always asking his fellow pro-lifers to consider what, what is, how is God asking me to pray about this issue and how is God asking me to work? And mm -hmm. I can guarantee you from Joe Scheidler's many years and from my years of, of working with him at the Pro-Life Action League that he founded in 1980, the labora that God is calling us to is something each one of us has to discern. And I can promise you that it is not complaining about bishops not doing what they should we're waiting for somebody else to take action or, you know, being angry about the media misportraying us. The labora, the work that God is calling each one of us to do is direct and, and involves mm -hmm. saving lives. He wanted us to be active outside the abortion facilities. And I couldn't help but reflect on that mission as he was dying, surrounded by family. He died in his own bed surrounded by a loving family, hearing words of consolation. What a contrast that is to the 850 or 900,000 unborn children who die in abortion totally and utterly abandoned. Unless we're there, if we're there to mourn for them, as, as my father called us to do, then we are there doing an incredible act of mercy, 
saying no to the culture that has abandoned them and giving them the only act of love they'll ever receive this side of eternity. Mm -hmm. And that's really his legacy is calling wow. on us to love unborn children, to love their mothers, and to do everything we can to bring this, the loving, saving grace of Christ to them. That's so beautiful. Eric, your father went from being a PR professional to a pro-life pioneer. Wasn't it truly the Roe v. Wade ruling that motivated him to create Pro-Life Action League with your mother and to develop sidewalk counseling? That's right. He, he was in, at home sick with pneumonia, ironically enough. Mm. Um, and he was a very healthy man who very rarely, rarely took a sick day. And uh, he was home when the Roe v. Wade ruling was handed down, and you couldn't believe what he was reading in the paper. He poured over those rulings. He called them a suicide note, a suicide note that America had written to itself, and that uh, if we followed, we were going to see the end of respect for any human life in our culture. And what have we seen? Yeah. We've seen the tearing apart of the family. We've seen increasing polarization. We've seen dehumanizing of our fellow citizens. And, and all of this flows from that same culture behind that ruling. Mm -hmm. and, and he knew he had to get involved. He knew he had to take action. And so he founded the Pro-Life Action League after several years working with different organizations because he wanted to put regular people to work in the way that he saw Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. do. So wow. incredible moment that he happened to pass on the day we were remembering Martin Luther King. He had marched with King in 1965 when he was a teacher at Mundelein College in Chicago. He had seen what it can happen when people take personal responsibility for redressing an injustice in their culture. And that's what the Pro-Life Action League is about. That's what Joe Scheidler was all about. And uh, as much as we miss him, it is a tremendous honor to be able to carry on his legacy and share his story with another generation. Oh my goodness, absolutely. And I only have about a minute left, Eric, but I just wanna mention your father had a case that went to the Supreme Court three times and he finally won unanimously. I know it was a case that dragged on for decades. Can you give just a quick little snapshot into the significance of that case for the pro-life movement? Sure, well, you know, Joe Scheidler's being mourned by a, a vast and loving family, by a huge pro-life community, but he also should be mourned by the entire country and thanked for what he did to preserve our right to assemble, to organize, to perform you know, direct action and protest, the Supreme Court could see the danger of using laws like the racketeering law that was used against him against a social justice cause. And so his case, now versus Scheidler, the longest running case in US federal court history, uh, established a, a basis of freedom that generations of Americans will be benefiting from going mm -hmm. into the future. So he, wow. he truly is not only a great Catholic and a great pro-lifer, but a great American who did something extremely important for his nation. Absolutely, and Eric, I, I had the greatest honor to interview your father about three and a half years ago. Now it's one of my greatest joys here at EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. So Eric, God bless you. We're continuing to pray for you and your family. Thank you so much, and keep those prayers coming for my dad and the whole pro-life movement. Absolutely. Coming up, a Grammy Award-winning singer-songwriter releases a pro-abortion song on the 40th anniversary of Roe v. Wade. I speak out next. Plus, a sneak peek of the March for Life virtual rally. A Catholic pro-life college student was chosen to speak and previews what her message is going to be next. Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hadro. A singer teams up with other musical artists like Cheryl Crow and Cyndi Lauper to release an abortion anthem on the anniversary of Roe vs. Wade. That is this week's Speak Out segment. Singer-songwriter Amanda Shires released the song Our Problem on the 48th anniversary of Roe vs. Wade. The song is about the conversations women have when deciding whether or not to get an abortion. Shires enlisted the help of musical heavyweights ranging from Cyndi Lauper, Linda Perry, and Cheryl Crow on bass. Lyrics include lines like this one, quote, and no one has to know, the scars won't even show, at least that's what I've heard, no bigger than a baby bird. In an interview with USA Today, Shires commented on releasing the song on Roe's anniversary, saying, the idea that we could regress to pre-Roe v. Wade, I mean, are you kidding me? It seems like everything keeps slipping away little by little. Shires has spoken publicly about her own past abortion, and she's written a song about that as well. 
The singer-songwriter says for this song, Our Problem, she wanted to highlight female friendship and their unconditional support and empathy towards women who undergo an abortion. To be clear, for any woman who has undergone an abortion, you have our love, you have our empathy and our mercy, you are welcome and loved in the church. There is healing and mercy here. And some of our most prominent pro-life leaders are women who have previously undergone abortions. But true loving sisterhood and true compassion does not mean supporting, enabling, and encouraging abortion in any way. It means if you come to us asking for our advice about getting an abortion, it means telling the truth, that abortion ends the life of a child, that it's not just a quick solution for a temporary problem, its ramifications will last forever. True sisterhood and true friendship means empowering women to choose life and then to be there to support them when they do that. That might mean financially or emotionally, it might take different forms. But as our own Mother Angelica once said, those who tell the truth love you. Those who tell you what you want to hear love themselves. Let us pray for healing for all women who have undergone abortions, that they may experience God's radical love and healing. And let us pray that our culture is courageous in speaking truth about life. The March for Life does look different this year. Now that it's virtual, Christendom College students will no longer be carrying the March for Life banner and leading the way. They've been asked to do that next year instead. Christendom student body president Elizabeth Eller was originally going to take the March for Life rally stage on the National Mall. While that won't happen, she has been invited to deliver a virtual speech for the virtual rally. Eller, previously the president of the Catholic College's pro-life group, says she's honored and grateful to be a part of this unique March for Life. She even gave us a preview of her virtual speech. I'm mostly talking about why I'm pro-life and what led me to really want to stand strong and be a voice for the voiceless this year, especially. And it also includes a call to action to all of my fellow young people because I do believe that um, the end of abortion is really in our hands and we do have the power. To Eller says standing up publicly and fearlessly for the value of all human life is the most important work we can do as Catholics and as Americans. She explains why she, a college student, is already so passionate about the pro-life issue. If we are killing thousands of innocent citizens every day in America, that is the greatest injustice that our nation has ever faced, and we have to stand up against it, and we have to stop that injustice. And the second reason that I am so passionately pro-life is because women deserve better than abortion. It is so inspiring to see such motivated and young pro-lifers. Keep it up, Elizabeth. That does it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Until next time, we'd love to hear from you. Find us on social media at EWTN Pro-Life on all social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we're there. You can also send us a message by emailing prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. we love to hear from you. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.